Welcome to one of my favorite events of the year, the faculty reading. Uh, we are an unusual creative writing program in being more literary and reading a lot of literature. Uh, it's condensed and very brief. And I hope it's not just institutional vanity, it's also an extraordinarily gifted, various faculty. I'm happy to say that I have learned from my colleagues, each of them, from reading them and from speaking to them, I have learned from these people. And uh, I know from many, many students and uh, from our excellent uh, official evaluations by students, uh, Many other people have learned as well as me. It's a pleasure to welcome you all. And it's a pleasure for me to be part of this group of people. And uh, we will begin with Leslie Epstein. The bios are in the chat. So I am happy to say I am not going to be an MC. I'm just a welcomer. Leslie Epstein, over to you. Uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, hello, everybody. I can't see you. I see you have misfortune of seeing me, I guess. Uh, I am going to read a chapter, a very brief chapter from a new book, a new novel, uh, Hill of Beans, uh, which uh, was published last month. Um, you can get it on Amazon. Uh, what you have to know in this chapter, which is called Gloria Palace, which is the name of an actual movie theater in Berlin. Uh, what you have to know is that we're in 1934 in Berlin. Uh, I'm going to mention two movies, uh, 20 Million Sweethearts and 42nd Street. 20 Million sweet, Sweethearts is at the beginning of the, of the chapter. I discovered after writing uh, the novel, in fact, a short while ago, that my uncle Julie was one of the writers, uncredited on that film. And the other film, these are both Warner Brothers pictures, is 42nd Street, 1933. Uh, and it's what I say about it at the end of this is true. Um, the other thing you're going to see is that um, the tactics used in the course of this chapter by the SA and Goebbels uh, were actually you. So just about everything you're going to read uh, did happen, though not necessarily at this particular film. So Gloria Palast, the subtitle would be Dr. Goebbels Goes to the Movies. And this is from his diary. Dinner alone and then the premiere at the Gloria Palace. I arrived 10 minutes late and with my hat pulled low, lest one in that crowd of more than a thousand recognize me. I take the spot that has been reserved off to one side of the balcony. On the screen, the American actor, Pal, is making a clown of himself as he sings for all the capitalists of the radio network, his beer hall ballad. Oh, he floats through the air with the greatest of ease. I have, of course, seen this production before, just as I have viewed every film for, before approving it for our masses. I already know the plot, how Powell, in spite of all, gets the job singing for the Soap King, his tycoon sponsor, and how his agent, O'Brien, that's Patrick O'Brien, <laughs> stops the romance between this new national sensation and Fraulein Rogers, this is Ginger Rogers. So in each of the women in his broadcast audience, those 20 million sweethearts will believe that she and she alone is the one he loves. Our own audience of good German citizens is no better. I hear them all around me laughing and clapping and cheering for this yodeling buffoon. I can't wait until, like well-trained Zirkus Seehunde, they will pull out their handkerchiefs as this dick turns to his ginger with the words, all my life I've waited for an angel, but no angel 
ever came along. Our sobbing, weeping, sentimental folk, just like these Americans sighing over their Philcos, their Crosleys, and their ugly wooden Zeniths. I shall make certain that soon there will be no such empty-headed radio listeners in the Reich. Rather, they will all be listening to what I want them to hear. 20 million sweethearts? I intend to guarantee that 80 million Germans fall no less deeply in love. What do the latest Volksenfanger cost? Less than 40 Reichsmarks. I am determined that every home in the nation shall possess one, no, not one, two, three, a receiver in every room. And each will be tuned to a single station, the Deutschland sender. And on this station, there will be a sole voice repeating over and over in one guise or another, the same message. Ein Volk, ein Reich, ein Führer. Now in the Gloria Palast, the time has come to act. With both hands, I raise my hat from my head as if the pressure from such pondering had made my skull swell inside it. Still too tight? I raise it again to make sure the Doomkopfe have seen it. Then I stand and move toward the nearest exit. I pause, not looking at the screen, but waiting to hear the words that I know will come from the loudspeakers behind it. Dick Powell at the microphone utters them aloud. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I have a real surprise for you. Yes, sir, I'm afraid you guessed it. It's the Mills Brothers. And this was an actual American, uh, Afro-American singing group. At once these four Schwarzeneggers burst into song. Baby, what are you out for? Baby, what am I in for? Is my baby out for no good? All this Afrikaner rouse, shouts a voice from somewhere down in the orchestra. Away with these nigger. Another voice closer by in the balcony cries, they're insulting the Aryan race. Some in the audience make shushing noises. A voice declares, we want to hear the music. Music? A German dares to call this music? That's the fellow in the balcony. Just listen, it's the sound of the zoo. As if following these instructions, everyone does seem to listen. Impossible to translate into German how the black men in their dark jackets and cream-colored pants turn the lyrics of the song into chaos. There's a lot of scat singing here. Rooty toot toot da poop a doop a doop a doop. Ha ha, a second man joins the first in the balcony. Monkeys have learned to talk. It is a lug song of the apes. Nine, the parliament of Africa. Now at the front of the orchestra, a small formation of S.A. marches before the first row of seats. Together they point up toward the far off projectionist window. This filth must stop. Turn off the machine. For a moment, nothing occurs. The primitive rhythms continue while our Berliners watch and listen, listen from their plush Gloria Palace seats. At last, one of our men in the balcony rushes forward and throws something that, trailing a stream of smoke, flies into the midst of the sitting crowd. A second man races ahead and hurls a similar missile, a similar missile. In seconds, the smell of sulfur, accompanied by alarming sparks, spreads through the theater. Now people begin to stand. They push by the ones who remain stubbornly seated. Suddenly a loud crash at the back of the room and the yellow beam in which have danced so many Warner Brothers dollars goes out. Simultaneously, the house lights come on to reveal at the front of the theater, a group of men wearing something like lab coats. Each carries a white cage, a wire cage, whose front latch he kneels down to open. The SA men are happy to offer an explanation. Here you are, ladies and gentlemen, your favorite entertainers, the 400 Mouse Brothers. Immediately, scores, perhaps there really are 400 in all, of white mice begin to run into the crowded auditorium. At the same time, the house lights once more go out. 
in the pitch dark, all is pandemonium. Women scream, men curse, fistfights break out as people climb over each other to reach the aisles. Suddenly, unmistakably, a single shot rings out. It seems to cause everyone to take in his breath. Then all the doors with a brown shirt to each side are flung open. The crowd streams out, some into the lobby, some directly into the street. In less than three minutes, the great hall stands empty. Thus will we remove all such filth from the minds of the German Volk. Of course, one film by these Judenschwein Warner brothers must remain. In the Reichskanzlei, I have been forced to see it 100 times. The plot, at the last minute, a chorus member replaces the star. The girls in their little frilled skirts, the identical smiles, the synchronization of movement. This is the perfection of an ideal. Women as the cogs and spokes and gears of an intricate machine. All limbs interchangeable, replaceable parts. Never a word from their mouths. They spread their legs. The camera moves through them. The Fuhrer is in heaven, six inch heels. And that's the end of this chapter. And now I'm rushing off to my class, which is waiting for me. And uh, instead of me, you have a real treat, uh, who is the great writer, Ha Jin, who is going to follow me. Good night, everybody. Hello, everyone. Uh I'm sorry if, uh, to show my bruised face. I had a fall yesterday after teaching my class. And this is, was due to the, the second shot of Moderna. So if you are going to take the vaccine, make sure you would sleep for a day or two, okay? <laughs> but I'm fine, I'm fine. Uh, I'm going to read from my uh, new novel, A Song Everlasting. Uh, it, which is coming out in July. Uh, this book is uh, uh, about a singer, an immigrant singer, uh, very celebrated one in China, but he had a very tough life. On the other hand, because of his fame, and the Chinese government tried hard to bring him back to China because that's good for the country's image. And they even tried to buy him back, but he wouldn't go back. So as a result, uh, his, uh, the, his passport was revoked and he couldn't get a visa when his mother uh, was dying. Uh, eventually he couldn't go back, couldn't attend the funeral. So just after that, uh, there is uh, in Boston, there was a, a kind of memorial uh, service uh, or gathering uh, at Boston Commons. And uh, he joined the event, but that was for the, the memory of uh, the Tiananmen Massacre. Uh, he went there mainly uh, to sing uh, as kind of a mourning for his mother, uh, but uh, he was surprised and uh, also people mistook his performance. Uh, so I'm going to read maybe a half scene, uh, so that, but that is the background. Uh, <clears throat> Then an American journalist, a, a tall 50 something man wearing a brown jacket went up and spoke about what he had witnessed on the night of June 3rd, 1989. He saw Palestine, <laughs> sorry. Please, uh, please turn off the phone. He saw pedestrians hit by random bullets, two civilians run over by a combat personal carrier, and a, groom scene, a gruesome scene at the front of a hospital where dozens of bodies were lined up waiting to be identified and claimed. That night destroyed my vision of China, he said. I used to study Chinese history 
and literature passionately at the University of Washington, dreaming of becoming a scholar in Chinese culture. The gunshots and bloodshed at Tiananmen Square killed the imagined China in my head and shattered my youthful dream. I simply cannot forget the brutal and grim, uh, grisly sights. I want to shout to the world, don't forget Tiananmen. After his speech, the performances began. Tian was the first, that's the singer's name. Tian was the first and he sang soulfully, giving all he had. With his eyes half closed, he began the song, I cannot forget. Mama, I still remember the lullaby you used to sing. Nestling in your arms, I went to sleep while your voice lingered in my ears. Mama, your sweet songs give me beautiful dreams and lifelong blessing, but now you are no longer here. Mama, now I'm far away from home, but I still hear your murmuring at night. Whenever I think of you, I'm full of tears. As he was singing, he saw his mother's lined face, mild and radiating love. She now smiled, now frowned, now glowed. Tears streamed down his cheeks. He could hardly hold himself together, but managed to finish the song. Out of habit, he didn't stay for the rest of the program, afraid that people would accost him or take photos with him. He never felt comfortable among the cr a crowd. His throat was still tight and his temples kept throbbing. He could see that his memorial, this memorial gathering had fallen short of uh, expectations. Indeed, over the years, such efforts had shrunk more or less to mere academic affairs, and the public seemed to have grown less interested and more forgetful. Hurriedly, he hatched away and headed for the Park Street station to catch the train back to Quincy. That's where he lives. <laughs> the local Chinese language media Res, uh, responded on, reported on the memorial event in Boston Common. One article praised Tian's performance, saying he had put all his heart into the song and that his, he was clearly a devout patriot. The writer went so far as to claim Yao Tian must see the mother in his son as the motherland that has abandoned him and her other children abroad, though all of them still love her passionately. What a stupid cliche, he said to himself. In the context of the Tiananmen massacre, China seemed to him more like an old hag, so senile, so ailing, that she had to eat the flesh and blood of her children to sustain herself. In the back of his mind lingered a question to which he didn't have, he didn't know how to answer it. If a country has betrayed a citizen, isn't the, the citizen entitled to betray the country? The article made him reflect on his personal emotion in the context of, of historical memory. In his performance, he's been motivated mainly by his mourning for his mother, but the manifestation of his grief was interpreted as a collective emotion shaped by the memory of a historical event. Nobody could tell how personal his singing was. All took it as a show of his love for the motherland. This was a misinter misinterpretation, but he wouldn't say it was a mistake. It only showed how the personal and the historical had converged. Okay, let me stop here. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, thank you. Shupe. Um, I wanted to um, I wanted to thank uh, Robert Pinsky uh, for his uh, leadership of the creative writing program and Catherine Kahn for her uh, all of her administrative work. Um, I'm going to read uh, I'm going to read five poems. Um, the first of these uh, returns us to Hollywood. Um, my wife and I have a weakness for submarine movies. Um, this first poem, uh, this first poem concerns a movie called Operation Pacific from 1951, uh, written and directed by George Wagner. Um, it's an extremely undistinguished example of the genre, um, but it features uh, astoundingly in the middle. Um, uh, it, it features a dialogue that's lifted uh, from Homer's The Odyssey. Um, a prophecy given to Odysseus of the nature of his death that occurs in Book 11 and Book 23. The poem is called The Old Story, and it's dedicated to my colleague Stephen Scully in the Classical Studies Department at BU. The Old Story. It was just a B-grade submarine movie, or maybe all sub-movies are B-grade, a vehicle for John Wayne, whose drawling virility I always resent, while Patricia Neal plays his ex-wife, though off-screen her lover Gary Cooper visited the set to try to persuade her to abort their fetus. And after all the cocky depth charges and dud torpedoes, while they're sitting together in a Honolulu nightclub, at the very moment when her dazed come hither look was on my last nerve, somehow the writer director to save himself like a drowning man from this property where the hero just keeps returning like a commuter, borrowed a few lines from the Odyssey and Neil as Lieutenant Junior Grade Mary Stewart reaches way back and not missing a beat while talking about a young pilot says to Duke, he wants to go someplace where they never heard of a Navy. His idea is to fly back to Wichita, Kansas and start walking inland, carrying a pair of oars and stop when he gets to a place where someone says, what is that anyway you got on your shoulders? A place where they never season the food with salt. And then he'll know that his wandering's done. That's it. He'll die in his own bed, surrounded by family. And although the reference goes right over Duke's head, it did feel as if a black hull had surfaced nearby, its teak decks sieving the creamy runnels of salt to watch a broken backed freighter in its death agony. Something that sudden, but also grave and ancient. The prophecy of peace after so much war. The underworld strangeness of it incongruous there amid all the routine lies of post-war Cold War Hollywood. The next poster, uh, the next poem is called a Tourist Poster of the 1930s. Um, and you have to imagine a kind of full color art deco poster. Um, the place depicted is uh, the town of Evian les Bains um, on the uh, south uh, shore of Lake Geneva, Lac Léman. Um, uh, Evian, the source of the sparkling water, is in France, and the city across the way, uh, Lausanne, is in Switzerland. Um, there's a French phrase in here um, which refers to um, when a, a, a sailboat with two sails is sailing before the wind with one sail on one side and one on the other. Um, it's said to be sailing uh, with, the, with hare's ears, with the ears of a hare. In other words, long, long ears, one on one side, one on the other. A tourist poster of the 1930s. 
Once upon a time, something happened in a city on the shore of a lake. The city was gracious with spires and ranged down a falling slope. It was a winter morning. The sky was gray. The streets smelled of burnt sugar and coffee. But in this view, it's, it's mid-afternoon and summer. The lawns are very green. In the foreground, a man and a woman are watching someone play golf. There's a touring car on a winding drive, beyond that, a casino, and finally, there is the lake. I recognize the slim paddle steamer and a little boat with Latin sails on oreille de lièvre, as they used to say. And only at the limit of the picture is there a low silhouette of the hills across the lake on the opposite shore behind the city I was speaking of, but with no suggestion of the city itself. Perhaps it is better this way. Deafness. The maple tosses its new crown, opening those passages the small birds love, closing them again, but air has been scrubbed of that treble. I noticed first on the avenue after the stillness of the concert hall and assumed it would return since it was late and I was tired and there had been light and conversations, not lead me to this granite shore and the panting of small waves between exclamations of wild aster or the wheeling of the little pulley attached to the catalpa trunk as the children's pegged laundry inches forward out of shadow, the gussets antic with bright color. Not leave me to remember how on my walk, I passed it every day, the harpsichord in a sold house, still propped for someone's hands to play and how its silence grew routine on the lid, a painted sky with clouds until one day that too was gone. Um, the next poem is called California King, uh, referring to the standard mattress size. Um, and uh, there's a reference to one of Mozart's operas in it too. California King. The little bright red car was stopped at a traffic light with a giant mattress tied to its roof and slopping down over the doors. A young white woman was driving, a young black man in the passenger seat. At the beginning of Mozart's opera, Figaro is measuring for their marriage bed and calls out the numbers to Susanna with just such an unselfconscious joy. Then the light changed and the car pulled away under its sagging load. And the last poem I'd like to read is called uh, Chamosser. Um, and the Chamosser is simply a, a pasture um, in the French Swiss Alps, a particular place. Chamosser. When I am dead, let them climb the steep June pasture to the top of the mountain where hang gliders wheel in the silence so close you can almost touch them. And past the midnight blue of gentian, past forget-me-not and globe flower, let them pour the salt and bone gravel into the void, the updraft and dizzy flue for the wind to carry away beyond the galleries of weird light and cold on Mont Blanc, south toward Rome and the golden house that has always waited there for me. Or else, following the lake to the city of Lausanne, west to mix with my mother's ghost in a livid February sky and the crematory smoke. Or east, where each morning I turned toward the sun 
and close, closing my eyes, try to rise in my head by a secret artery to the Brahma world of no returning. I hope it won't be north somehow. North is too hard for me with its long day and its short day. People wait in the shadows in the north. I don't get to choose, I know, but I wonder, will the wind seem even briefly to hesitate before gripping that ragged ashy wing, deciding which way to go? I doubt there'll be time. Thank you very much. And um, I'd like to introduce Gail Mazur. Thank you, Carl. What a great reading this is. I am going to read three poems if I hold out that long. Uh, the first one is called Mount Fuji and, and it is addressed to my husband, Michael, who was a painter. Mount Fuji, Hokusai and Harnobu, my first presence to you, two linen bound books that closed with loop ribbons and faux ivory clasps. Decades later, we gaped at Fuji from a window of Japan air and gasped together in Narita, a park so immaculate white rocks gleamed graphic in a river of gravel. Later still, you'd move between the floating worlds of ukiyo-e woodcuts and Chinese landscapes whose services entered you as if it had been faded. A draftsman's draftsman, Hokusai at 70, thought he'd begun to grasp the structures of birds and beasts, insects and fish, of the way plants grow, hoped that by 90, he'd have penetrated to their essential nature. And more by 100, I will have reached the stage where every dot, every mark I make will be alive. You always loved that resolve you'd repeat joyfully, Hokusai's utterance of faith in work's possibilities, its reward that at 110, he'd perhaps have learned to draw. In Edo then, his beloved Fuji was seen as the true source of immortality, as for him it was to be. Will you always give me such spectacular gifts, you asked me that day, that day when we were 20. And, and this poem is actually um, remembering being with Mike when he was growing outside. It's called Three Trees. August afternoon, rag paper, Windsor Newton charcoal, blackened kneaded eraser beside you in the grass. Three bare oak trees. You loved what you called the spikiness of forms, agreed with Rodin that nothing in nature is ugly. Monumental, burnt, those trees expressive for you, as close as if your charcoal had been made of them. You loved the susurrus of brush on canvas, the shh that charcoal made on paper. You even liked ekphrastic poems. I hated them. You'd love me writing this. That day I asked, was it the only time I asked what you've been thinking while you drew? And you looked at me blankly. You'd already explained so much to me. That day I wanted to know more, to be inside you, inside your working mind. What, what, how you answered. Tree, tree, tree. And my, my uh, last poem I read is called Matza, and it's set in Mount Auburn Cemetery, which was the earliest garden cemetery in America. And not so commonly known, it was originally 
land was the farm of Robert Creeley's grand, great grandfather who sold it to the Mount New Mount Auburn Cemetery Association. And that comes up in the poem. And this is definitely a pandemic poem. Matzah, as if to mock me and my widowhood, as if to deride my pandemic isolation, an enormous carton arrives at my door, a cosmic error from the Yehuda Matzah Company, 10 boxes, which should last long enough to get incinerated with me someday at the venerable New England cemetery that was once the struggling family farm, Mount Auburn, of poet Robert Creeley's great grandfather, where his descendants can be buried together, gratis, ad et perm, mirabile dictu, that Bob, the ashes of my beloved and mine, will lie close in the pastoral landscape I like to walk on late spring or early mornings, autumn mornings in the new world's first arboreal graveyard, a sanctuary really, for mourners, bird watchers, and my friends, the Sunday botanizers. Will I be buried or will my ashes be sprinkled with old dry crumbs of Yehuda's uncalled for unrisen bread to feed the Eastern wood peewee or the poor solitary sandpiper or the resident loons? Such questions never arose before in what we now call normal times when I brought cut flowers to lay on the stone etched with our names, a palette, a brush and pen, nestled nearby the austere markers of other Jews and Chinese and Armenians by Malamud and Achilles Fan and Izzy Stone, not so near Longfellow and Fanny Farmer or Mary Baker Eddy and her apocryphal phone overlooking a pond that's the serene home all summer long to a picturesque pair of weeping willows and two lazy white swans. Who on earth could have been the misinformed deliverer of such excess to my door, of such harsh symbols of my people's eternal hardships? Oh, my dear Yehuda Matzah, my poor Yehuda Matzah, how in your crisp hard plenitude today you ridicule and tend to amuse me. Oh, believe me, I've never forgotten all the millennia when you've been baked with the pain and salty tears of my people's exodus. So yes, I will eat and eat alone until the day comes when I can eat no more of our unleavened bread. I am delighted to say that Shrigrid Nunes will be reading now. Hello. Hello, everyone, and thank you all for being here. I'm going to read a, a section from my, um, my new novel, What Are You Going Through, which came out in September. And I, you don't really, I don't have to set it up. You don't really need to know anything beforehand. The journal I had planned to keep a record of my friend's last days, that never happened. I started it, but almost immediately I stopped. I did not even save the few pages I had written. I discovered that I didn't want to make a written record after all. The reason seemed to be that I had no faith in it. From the beginning, it felt like a betrayal. I don't mean of my friend's privacy, but of the experience itself. No matter how hard I tried, the language could never be good enough. The reality of what was happening could never be precisely expressed. Even before I began, I knew that whatever I might manage to describe would turn out to be at best somewhere to the side of the thing while the thing itself slipped past me like the cat you never even see escape when you open the house door. We talk glibly about finding the right words, but about the most important things, those words we never find. We put the words down as they must be put down, one after the other, but that is not life, that is not death, one word after the other. No, that is not right at all. 
no matter how hard we try to put the most important things into words, it is always like toe dancing in clogs. Understood, language would end up falsifying everything as language always does. Why then create an inauthentic document to be taken, mistaken by anyone who later read it, including even myself, for the truth? I have not so far regretted not having kept the journal, though I suppose one day I might. On the other hand, I find myself thinking about a film called No Home Movie, in which the Belgian filmmaker Chantal Ackerman documented conversations with her mother during the last months of her mother's life. We should all be great filmmakers. I understand it's a thing now, people making videos and arranging to have them delivered posthumously to one or more, more persons whom they knew in life. In some cases, the video is intended to be shown at the, the deceased's memorial service. I'm not sure why, but I find it hard to imagine this being done in any way that doesn't feel cheesy. The podcast my friend had told me about, the one she'd made at the request of a hospital social worker to answer questions about what it was like to be terminally ill and which she afterward regretted. As I'd suspected, it's not as bad as she made it sound. I at least would not describe it as she did as her going off the rails, even though she made me wince a few times. What will I miss most? I won't miss anything. I'll be dead. I won't have any feelings. Brittle little laugh. She sounds irked. She is irked. How she loathes the term bucket list. How she prefers fatal to terminal. Not only does she not believe in an afterlife, she is gobsmacked that so many people do believe in one. Probably it was her tone that she regretted. She didn't want to appear angry or bitter. To be emotional over your own death was unbecoming. Her use of that word on the podcast was one winceable moment. To the end, she clung to an image of stoical poise. Being already there, I get sucked in and listen to the other episodes in this series. No surprise that most of the participants are women, as is the social worker. Aren't women always more willing than men to talk about their feelings? Why wouldn't they be more willing to talk about being ill and what they're going through as they face death? Besides, most of those interviewed are old, and everyone knows how laconic old men tend to be, especially if at some time in their lives they've been to war. Also, it seems to me that when asked to do something for someone else, women, even if not greatly enthused, are more likely than men to oblige. There appears to be some controversy about studies, of which there are no few, that involve asking the dying for interviews or to fill out surveys or questionnaires and so on. Is it ethical to take up the time of those to whom so little time remains, ask some. What I hear listening to the podcast is an extraordinary amount of accord. Whether or not there is acceptance, there is also fear, fear of pain, fear of the dark. Even those who do go gentle, don't seem entirely sure about the good part. It seems the one person with whom the poet could not share his poem was the very one who had inspired it and who is addressed in it, the reason being that Dylan Thomas's father hadn't been told that he was dying. Far more anxiety than Zen, I hear. Every single one of those interviewed has watched someone die before them. Bucket lists and last wishes are modest. One more Christmas, one more spring. I'm hoping for a last vacation with the grandkids, to make my son's law school graduation, to finish the renovations on the house. Several find themselves quite naturally dwelling on the past. Mother's face keeps coming back. The anger I felt all these years about my divorce, I don't feel anymore. Sadness and worry for those left behind, for whom one's death is predicted to be harder than for oneself. If only my kids weren't so young. 
I'm not sure my husband even knows where the kitchen is. He's going to starve to death. And what about the cats? An absence of self-pity, with the exception of the mother of the young kids. She did everything right, this woman assures us. She never hurt anyone. She played by all the rules. She was a good person. Why her? Why her? Why her? An absence of humor, with the exception of one very raspy-voiced 50-year-old man who obsesses about his epitaph. He's heard a lot of good ones, he says, his favorite being, see you soon. Can I use one that's already been used before, he asks, or would that be plagiarism? As if he might get sued for that. The man who plagiarized his epitaph and other poems, my friend would have loved it. Bucket list comes from kick the bucket, of course, but where kick the bucket comes from, no one seems to know. What does a bucket have to do with anything? Why, why kick it? And is there supposed to be something in the bucket? I always thought it was about a dying horse. It kicked its bucket when it collapsed, but I can find no source for this. Any connection to the Russian superstition that seeing someone carrying an empty bucket is a bad omen? Except for my friend and one other woman who says simply that she doesn't know, everyone says they believe they will see their loved ones again. Not for the first time I note that no one ever seems to be afraid of going to hell. Hell is other people if you agree with Sartre. Evidently to most it's for other people, never for yourself, and never for the ones you're looking forward to seeing again like the extinction of life on earth as a result of nuclear war or climate change, an afterlife that includes the possibility of never ending fear and pain appears to be a horror too vast to be assimilable. I catch myself wishing not without guilt that the podcast were more interesting. Bored by the way they talk about themselves and feeling shitty about it, I can't help suspecting that Rather than say what they really think or feel, these people are saying what they think other people want to hear, meaning what is acceptable, appropriate, becoming. Dying is a role we play like any other role in life. This is a troubling thought. You are never your true self except when you're alone, but who wants to be alone dying? But is it too much to want somebody somewhere to say something original about it. Thank you. Thank you. And next up, we have Robert Pinsky. I'm going to read, I'm going to read a very short poem and then about four pages of prose. The poem is called Being a Ghost. When they die, I become a ghost, afloat from room to room, as vague in grief as when I can't find my keys. Some say zombies became popular when phones got so smart, we began to stagger, staring at them entranced. Alone, without my dead to phone, I'm left adrift, as when I can't remember a name I know I know. Shadowy, appalled ghost mind, aghast at the crowd of names, stranded, alive, ashore, out waiting my shadowy boat. The poem came very much from grief for my friend, the great poet, Charlie Williams, when I first met him decades ago, he was teaching at BU, I wasn't. Uh, I've said that I learned from my colleagues. Uh, I, uh, uh, next spring, I'm gonna publish a prose autobiography and I'm grateful to Gail and Carl for looking at it, but in particular, thanks to my dear friend, Nicole Seeley, 
who very patiently read every single chapter and gave me very good advice. And I'm now hoping to surprise Nicole by reading a new passage. Uh, at one point she said, uh, I wish there was more about you in this autobiography, Robert, or something like that. And uh, so the passage is from the chapter about names called Naming Names. And I now begin it <clears throat> with a bit about my childhood reading. Naming Names. I think I remember the exact moment when I became a writer, though I was too young to think of it that way. An early reader, I read the Lewis Carroll Alice books over and over, feeling the narrative, the narrative reality, purely innocent of much distinction between a book and a movie, between a movie and a fantasy, between playing cowboys and hearing a Tom Nix cowboy story on the radio. It was all story, and in some sense, all real. My favorite passage was the story of Alice and the fawn in the wood where things have no names. I was moved by the intimate awkwardness of Alice's two arms clasped about the fawn's neck as they walk together in the tenniel illustration. The girl and the animal look peaceful and a little sad, as though they sense the coming moment when they will leave the wood where things have no names. And Alice will remember her name. She knew it began with an L. And the fawn will cry out, I'm a fawn. Then with a sudden look of alarm in its beautiful brown eyes, it runs away. One day, I decided to give myself the pleasure of reading that story again. The illustration made the page easy to find. But what I remembered like a feature length movie was less than a page, just a few sentences. That seemed impossible, but there it was. From the words, just then a fawn came wandering by, to it had darted away at full speed, the whole vivid large episode uses only what I can now count as just 221 words. I felt first a mixture of outrage and mystification. How could the book I loved have tricked me that way? With a few words, then I felt wonder, how was something so real created in such a small space? How had the writer made me build so much inside my mind? That question became permanent, my fate. I also read and reread Mark Twain's Connecticut Yankee in a King Arthur's Court over and over. That book mocked the old European pieties and hierarchies, while at the same time making them fascinating. Twain's King Arthur was a jerk, yet genuinely noble. Smart provincial naifs and undaunted immigrants could absorb the best of the old inherited orders and exceed them. So I was led to believe by Mark Twain and by movies and by all sorts of jokes and family stories, movies and comic books. I read the novel Ivanhoe and saw the movie in an order I can't remember. In Walter Scott's tale, the oppressed Saxons suffered as deplaced underdogs, displaced underdogs. The snooty dominant Normans treated them like dirt. As a disciple of Twain, I even called the writer Walter Scott without the sir. I pondered the attachment of Ivanhoe, the knightly Saxon, to the Jew named Isaac of Monmouth, 
played by a British actor named Felix Elmer, and Isaac's exquisite daughter, Rebecca. Merging the book with the movie, I puzzled over Scott's condescending sympathy for the pathetically vulnerable Isaac and Isaac's daughter, the supremely desirable Rebecca, played by Elizabeth Taylor at the peak of her super movie star beauty. Will the Christians, good, bad, and indifferent ones, kill her or marry her or what? That question somehow involved three kinds of name, the fictional names of characters, the real or made up names of actors, and the names of us real people. I puzzled over the name Isaac of Mammoth, not Goldberg or Shapiro or Pinsky, but of Mammoth. My Jersey Shore hometown Long Branch is in Monmouth County. I live near the corner of Monmouth Avenue, where mostly Black people lived. Why of Monmouth? It was as though Walter Scott anticipated the name changes to place names far in the future of many American Jews. From a twisting, invisible grapevine of culture, I already knew that the last names Berlin and London were Jewish or more precisely, Jewish substitutes for previous names. So why not Mammoth? Or is that pattern misleading? Was Isaac of Mammoth's name not a product of anglicizing, a word I had not yet learned for something I already knew about? The main screenwriter for that 1952 Ivanhoe, Marguerite Roberts, was blacklisted in Hollywood after she defied the House Un-American Activities Committee. To the shame of MGM and the Screenwriters Guild, her name, she was born with it in Nebraska, was removed from the movie's credits. For nine years, Roberts could not work as a screenwriter. In the movie Marguerite Roberts wrote, the beautiful Jewess Rebecca of Mammoth is condemned to burn at the stake by the fanatical Christian order of Knights Templar. Rescued from burning by Ivanhoe, Elizabeth Taylor, as the Jewish Rebecca, is radiant. A clumsy Norman warrior, played by a hefty character actor, against his will falls in love with Rebecca. Even that fat ruling class dumbbell could recognize that she was something special. So could an 11 year old boy. The immigrant movie moguls who created the movie industry understood money in relation to language in general and to names in particular. They renamed Sprangler Rug, so he became Robert Taylor, eligible to portray the Saxon underdog Ivanhoe. Watching the movie, I listened intensely to the former Spangler Brug as Ivanhoe and Elizabeth Taylor as Rebecca of Mammoth, as they spoke lines I couldn't know were written by the blacklisted Marguerite Roberts. A name, differently from skin color or bank accounts, but sometimes overlapping with them, can be a social barometer, a matter for scrutiny and anxiety. How and how much did I notice, beginning at what age, that the two movie stars of Ivanhoe, Elizabeth and Robert, had the same last name, Taylor? Did spelling that name with a Y elevate it, make it classier than Taylor with an I, a trade in the garment industry? Now, toward the other end of my life, names come to mind again. Each name also a word, and the combination of a first with a last name is a phrase, as in Taylor. In various ways, a person can be two words, as when I am Robert Pinsky. After midnight on March 13th, 2020, 
A young emergency medical technician was shot dead in her bed in her Lexington, Kentucky apartment by police officers who had battered down her door. There is no evidence that she or her apartment had anything to do with any crime. She was a black woman and her name is Brianna Taylor with a Y. Her killing was not prosecuted. My history in all senses of that word leads me to consider how the prosecutors or the judge who issued a warrant to invade her apartment read meaning into the two words, Brianna Taylor. My father, Milford Pinsky's unusual first name is a variation on the names of English poets, Milton, Herbert, Sidney, that immigrants in his parents' generation often chose for their children. Early in my life, I recognized a live, irrational organism that was dreadful and fascinating. It made him Milford and it made her Brianna. To understand that monstrous creature with its delusions that function as lethal realities takes more than a lifetime of effort. I have to remind you all that uh, after Nicole Seeley's reading, which will be the last one, uh, there is going to be an after party at a website which Catherine Kahn will post in the chat. And uh, here is the aforementioned Nicole Seeley. Thank you, Robert. Um, and thank you to both Catherine and Robert for organizing and everyone for reading their brilliant work. Happy and honored and humbled to be um, with you all today. Uh, four poems, the first of which um, is, is called Hysterical Strength, but my reading, I'll read four poems and it's dedicated to Makai Bryant, the latest black child murdered by police just yesterday. Hysterical strength. When I hear news of a hitchhiker struck by lightning yet living, or a child lifting a two-ton sedan to free his father pinned underneath, or a camper fighting off a grizzly with her bare hands until someone, a hunter perhaps, can shoot it dead. My thoughts turn to black people the hysterical strength we must possess to survive our very existence, which I fear many believe is and treat as itself a freak occurrence. But this next poem is called, It's Not Fitness, It's a Lifestyle, and it takes its title from the motto of uh, Equinox, which is the luxury gym. It's not fitness, it's a lifestyle. I'm waiting for a white woman in this overpriced equinox to mistake me for someone other than a paying member. I can see it now as I leave the steam room naked but for my wedding ring. She'll ask whether I've finished cleaning it. Every time I'm at an airport, I see a bird flying around inside. So fast, I can't make out its wings. I ask myself, what is it doing here? I've come to answer, what is any of us? Uh, this next poem is uh, inspired by the work of art called Candelabra with Heads um, by the artist Thomas Hirshhorn. And this piece, it looks like uh, a bunch of mannequins uh, lifted up on a wooden platform and wrapped in brown duct tape. 
This is candelabra with heads. Had I not brought with me my mind as it has been made, this thing, this brood of mannequins cocooned and mounted on a wooden scaffold might be eight infants swaddled and sleeping. Might be eight fleshy fingers on one hand. Might be a family tree with eight pictured frames. Such treaties occur in the brain. Can you see them hanging? Their shadow is a crowd stripping the tree of souvenirs. Skin shrinks and splits. The bodies weep fat the color of yolk. Can you smell them burning? Their perfume climbing as a wisteria would a trellis. As wisteria would a trellis burning. Their perfume climbing fat the color of yolk. Can you smell them? Skin shrinks and splits. The bodies weep. Is a crowd stripping the tree of souvenirs. Can you see them hanging? Their shadow frames. Such treaties occur in the brain. Might be a family tree with eight pictures. Might be eight fleshy fingers on one hand. Might be eight infants swaddled and sleeping and mounted on a wooden scaffold. This brood of mannequins cocooned as it has been made this thing, had I not brought with me my mind. You can see this and not see lynchings. And my last poem is called In Defense of Candelabra with Heads. And it's after the poem that I just read. Um, in my chat book, The Animal After Whom Other Animals Are Named, at the advice of editors who I adore and respect, I extracted that last line, who can see this and not see lynchings from that last poem I read. Um, but for my full length, I decided to include that line because I felt that it was necessary for the poem. So this poem in defense of candelabra with heads speaks to, the, to that impulse um, of inclusion uh, of that last line in uh, the full length. In defense of candelabra with heads. If you've read the candelabra with heads that appears in this collection and the one in the animal, thank you. The original, the one included here is an example, I'm told, of a poem that can speak for itself but loses faith in its ability to do so by ending with a thesis question. Yeats said a poem should click shut like a well-made box. I don't disagree. I ask who can see this and not see lynchings, not because I don't trust you, dear reader, or my own abilities. I ask because the imagination would have us believe much like faith, faith the original candelabra lacks in things unseen. You should know that human limbs burn like branches and branches like human limbs. Only after man began hanging man from trees, then setting him on fire, which would jump from limb to branch like a bastard species of bird, did we come to know such things. A hundred years from now, October 9, 2116, 8, 18 p.m., when all but the lucky are good and dead, may someone happen upon the question in question. May that lucky someone be black and so far removed from the verb lynch that she be dumbfounded by its meaning. May she then call up her Shorn's candelabra with heads. May her imagination, not her memory, run wild. Thank you. See you all in the after party at the site that Catherine Kahn is going to put on the chat. And about these people reading their work, I told you so. <laughs>